Hey, I'm Lucas. I'm a software engineer working for that big red name up there, Redbubble. Um, and as Andrew said, I'm here to talk about moving from a continuous delivery environment to continuous deployment. So what I'm going to do tonight is give you the highlights of our story um, and hopefully they help make your story better. Uh, so first of all, let's play a game of spot the difference. Um, whoops. Bit trigger happy. Um, so we've got these two terms here, right? Continuous delivery and continuous deployment. Um, they're similar words, but they mean slightly different things. Um, so I'm going to clarify how I'm going to use them tonight. Um, I looked them up on that most authoritative of sources, Wikipedia. So hopefully I'm in agreement with the, the rest of the community about this. Um, so under a continuous delivery um, scheme, any version of the code that reaches um, your, your master branch your, your, or your trunk could be deployed to your production environment at any time. And that's slightly different from um, uh, deploying every time, but um, some reasons you might adopt this, uh, this kind of pattern is perhaps you have some, um, like a very high cost of deploying, say, maybe it takes a long time. Um, or deployment is a manual process, um, or perhaps you have some key people who need to um, approve every deployment, say, like um, a QA manager or, or someone like that. Um, so then we've got our continuous deployment environment where every version of, of the trunk or of master, every push does get deployed to production right away. Um, usually as uh, an automatic process. So the difference here is, is basically one of process of how frequently, how frequently you deploy um, and also of the, it generally means a difference in the significance of deployments as an event, right? So uh, continuous delivery or continuous integration, a deployment is or may be a really big deal, something that happens maybe once a week, maybe once a month, maybe even less frequently than that. Um, if you're deploying continuously, um, you'll find that deployment becomes basically a non-event. Um, you're probably pushing tiny changes because the cost of deploying has become so low and you'll get to the point where even the person who pushed the change, who triggered the deployment, might have to be notified that it's completed because they won't necessarily notice a difference in, unless they're looking for it, say in, um, uh, so looking for the feature that they implemented, looking for the, um, the fix to the bug that they were, um, that they were addressing. So uh, that's, that's our difference there. So I'll, um, I'll start off with the place where we started, um, just to, uh, yeah, so we've all got a bit of context. So we started with a continuous delivery environment and manual deployments. So um, yeah, any uh, so any of our changes could be deployed to master, and most of them were. But um, by so the our deployment process, I'll I'll get a bit more into that but basically involved um, engineers, developers running commands on machines like this one. Um, and the biggest problem that we had with this process was that uh, only one deployment is allowed to happen at a time. We, uh, we can't have concurrency because our environment won't support it, right? Um, so to work around this problem where only one person is allowed to deploy at a time, we um, opened up a Slack room where we track who's currently deploying. And so we had a little a system of you know, terms like um, next to, to join the queue, um, done to say I'm finished, the next person's, the next person's um, allowed to go. Um, and eventually even that became hard to track. So um, it, was, it was hard to tell from looking at the chat history who was deploying right now. 
or if I'm waiting in the queue, how many people are in front of me. Uh, so we developed a Slack bot to help us manage this queue. So I would say next, and this chat bot would pipe up and say, okay, you're behind this person, this person, that person in the queue. And it would um, notify me when it was my turn to deploy. Um, so, you know, we got um, quite invested in working around this problem instead of solving it. Um, so, when it's your turn to deploy, this is the process that would follow. So, um, sorry, a bit before it's your turn to deploy. So, first up, you'd join the queue in the chat room and you'd wait for your turn, and that might take a while. Then, uh, once it's my turn, I merge my changes. So I'll hit the, hit the big green button on GitHub, and then my change is on master. So then uh, uh, that'll kick off a build on our continuous integration tool, and I'll have to wait maybe 10 minutes for that build to pass. Um, once it's passed and I notice, and I've probably gotten distracted by this point, I'll be you know, reading an article or working on something else, but I notice the build's passed. And so I open up the terminal and I run my deployment commands and the deployment takes a bit of time. I wait for it to finish and hopefully I don't get distracted again. Um, but when it finishes, I'll, um, I'll do whatever testing I need to do to verify that everything's okay. Check for errors, check the logs, check um, monitoring to make sure that I haven't made the site too slow and all that kind of thing. And once those checks are, once I'm happy with that, we're done, we're good, and I can start the process again. Um, so this whole process takes anywhere from maybe 20 minutes to maybe an hour um, by the time, you know, maybe a couple of people ahead of me take a few minutes to notice that there's something for them to do um, while I do the same thing, while my build's running. Those, those minutes add up pretty fast. Um, and there's also lots of room for human error to creep in where um, you know, maybe I have a couple of tabs open on GitHub and I merge the wrong change or, um, or there's a broken build on master, there's some integration problem or I run the wrong command and deploy to the wrong environment. I mean, those, those things are pretty rare but there's, there's a non-zero potential for those things to happen. Um, so, there are a few good things about this, uh, this whole situation, right? One is that every engineer knows how to deploy, and every engineer is responsible for deploying their own work. And that's a very powerful thing. Um, every engineer can deploy for their own laptop, right? And that, um, that means we have fewer single points of failure, um, so there's no one blessed deployment machine like there is in some other environments. Um, and, you know, if that, if that machine um, stops working for some reason or, or goes away, then we have to do a lot of work before we can deploy again. Not a problem in this environment. Um, there are a few steps to deploy. You know, a seven step process for deployment is not too bad and it's widely, um, those steps are widely understood by, uh, by all our engineers. Um, most of our engineers will deploy a change to production within maybe three days of them starting. We aim for one, it's usually, usually two or three. Uh, and all of our deployment gates, uh, so those, those decision points where we decide whether to deploy or not, they're all automated. They're all in that continuous integration um, build. So we get very fast feedback and, and um, reliable feedback about whether our change is good or not. Um, and then there are the bad points, right? Um, these are, I've seen these in more than just Redbubble, but relatively few engineers understand how the build works uh, or how deployments work. Um, for a lot of uh, junior developers particularly, it's a bit of black magic. We know that if I, if I you know, in, say the steps to the spell in the right order, my code will get to production, but um, we, don't, we don't know how. Um, we have this honor system for avoiding collisions, right? So um, my mate, if I'm um, waiting patiently in the deployment um, in the deployment <laughs> channel for my turn with the token, but my colleague Toby over there, I don't have a colleague Toby, but he's over there and he's like, <laughs> woohoo, yeehaw, and he's going to deploy. Um, we've got no kind of uh, guaranteed way of avoiding that. Um, 
So, you know, Toby will get a slap on the wrist, but meanwhile, I've got to wait another 20 minutes while he, um, while he deploys his code. So there's lots of wasted time involved as well in those kind of few minute gaps where someone doesn't notice that uh, they've, got, they've got something to do or um, a build fails for some, because of a bad merge or some trivial reason. Uh, so, with all that, why change, right? Um, things, relatively speaking, are pretty good, but um, there are some good reasons why we might want to move from a continuous delivery environment to continuous deployment. The first one of those is faster deploys, right? Um, every step, when it's finished, triggers the next step right away. You don't have any human intervention required, and that speeds things up a um, ridiculous amount, actually. We got from a 20 to 60 minute kind of, um, kind of uh, length of deployment process down to about 15 minutes for, um, for each change to go out to production. Uh, more automation generally means less room for human error, so that on a system we were talking about before, it's no longer a problem. Anyone can merge at any time, um, as long as their build is green, and the system will take care of the rest. And all of this leads us to become very popular with our fellow engineers. So our, um, our net promoter score from within our team is a delivery engineering team where really our clients are really the other engineering teams at Redbubble. So our, um, their approval of us and of the work that we do is very important. Um, and we measure that with a, a tool called the Net Promoter Score, where we um, survey the developers on the team periodically and find out on the whole, um, would they be inclined to recommend the tools and platform that we provide to other engineers, or are they neutral, or are they detractors? Are they saying, God, don't go near it, it's a mess. So we wanna, we wanna get that, that net promoter score rising, which, is, um, which means popularity, which means we're doing our job right. So here's how we're aiming to make it happen, right? Or how we aimed to make it happen. Uh, we use the same process. We've got this battle-tested, production-hardened process for getting code into the environment. So why would we change that? We want to keep the same steps, but we want to remove the bad stuff, all that waiting, all that human intervention. So that means no humans running commands on terminals. Uh, means no messy waiting about for people to pass me a token when they decide they're finished with it. It means I get notified when the thing's done. I just merge my code, then I get the, the chat message or the email to say, hey, your thing's ready. Maybe go check those metrics now. Um, but at the end of it all, I'm still the one checking for the results of my changes. Right? I'm still answerable, I'm still responsible for that. So I'm the one checking for performance to see if there are any errors I caused, if the errors I was intending to fix are fixed all of that business. The human's still the one who's responsible. So, having figured out what we want to do and uh, what we want to achieve by doing it, here's what we did. First thing was to make our use of BuildKite more secure. Beef up build site security and I've got a picture of a goat. Okay, um, I'll work on that one. Um, but we, uh, we found when we went to have a look at BuildKite, we were planning to use BuildKite as, um, as our continuous deployment tool as well as our continuous integration tool. But we found that we had uh, some security problems. Uh, so a lot of keys being exposed in the UI, secrets that we really don't want um, you know, just floating around out there found a couple of SSH keys in uh, Git repositories, that's been fixed. Um, so, but that was the kind of thing we were working on. Um, we actually spent quite a lot of time on this step because um, we spent a lot of time working on um, Amazon machine images, which have a really long round trip time to make a change and to test it and to get the feedback. 
took us quite a while. It was in fact probably a little bit too much time that we spent on this step. Um, and that's primarily because we, um, we failed to think up front about exactly what we wanted to achieve and exactly how we were going to achieve it. So we just kind of assumed, yeah, build card will do the job. Um, let's go with that. The next thing that happened was we discovered that for purpose continuous deployment products are actually a thing and they exist. Um, we found one called Samson that's an open source project made by Zendesk um, and having found its existence we, we checked out a couple of other tools as well. Um, decided that Samson was going to match our feature list pretty well we, uh, we tried it out in a, a throwaway environment to see if it would do the job for us um, or had the potential to do the job for us. So we found that it did. We, um, we changed gears a little bit, mixed some metaphors, and then we, uh, then we were using Samson uh, rather than BuildKite. So that's primarily because you can use BuildKite or a tool like it, a continuous integration tool, to do continuous deployment. It does the same things, running commands, keeping track of what ran and when. Um, when you get to stuff, features like um, notification, like telling people when things have um, been deployed successfully, when things have failed, it starts to get just a little bit kludgy. So we, we decided that a for-purpose tool was going to be much better for our needs, particularly a free one. So. We deployed Samson to a test environment, put it through its paces a bit more, some more um, realistic tests and use cases. Um, so deploying um, not to production, but to our staging environment, using the, the real application code with our real um, deployment process. Found a couple of things that we, um, th that we, a couple of gaps, a couple of missing features. Um, for example, email on success is not a thing in Samson by default. You can, um, you can say email this address every time a deployment occurs, whether it succeeds or fails. Um, we thought that would be really spammy for most of our engineers, um, so, and they'd end up getting filtered and, and therefore useless, right? So we implemented some plugins to fill in those gaps. Um, so in the case of the success email, um, we got our package of changes, we found the list of commits, and then we just emailed the authors of those commits to say, hey, your code's in production now, you probably want to go and take a look. So we're, we uh, started emailing just the, just the right people, just notifying the right people for the particular change that's gone out. Still might be noisy, but um, nowhere near as noisy as it could be. So, having done all this testing, we deploy it to production. Ba -ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Um, not quite. The trumpets haven't sounded yet. We've deployed a, a production Samson application, right? Um, lucky for us, we've had some practice deploying Rails applications. Samson's just another Rails application. So that was all in all pretty easy for us. Um, not one of the more significant steps. Um, if you are using some stack, if you're used to a stack other than Rails, this might be a little bit more of a challenge. But generally, um, it's a Ruby application and a database, and that's the, uh, that's the basic setup. Um, so when we, uh, once we did this and we set up our, our project, told it which repo to get code from, um, and which branch it should continuously deploy, uh, master in this case, master in most cases, we, um, we had the capacity to deploy automatically and continuously to production. The missing step was we hadn't yet turned it on because we hadn't told anybody about it. So the next step, we do a bit of a shakeout test, um, same kind of tests we did in that staging environment in step four. We hit the big switch, and then we announce, we celebrate, we monitor, and oh, we document. Right. Um, so we uh, we showed it off at our our fortnightly showcase. 
Um, the COO came by the next day and gave us a very nice bottle of wine to share. It's quite delicious. Um, we kept an eye on deployments for uh, by you know all engineers for the next couple of days just to look out for any errors, help people out with their issues, and we started encountering quite a few questions about you know what's um, what do I do if I need to put a hold on deployments for a while? How does that work? Um, and you know, turns out there's a feature for that, and that's fine. But uh, no one knew about it. Um, do I need to still wait in the chat room for the um, for the deployment token? So we published some of those FAQs within a couple of hours of hitting the switch, uh, which was you know better than it could have been, but still way too late. Um, and we've been working on catching up on that documentation ever since we deployed about a week ago. So, where does that leave us? Where are we now? Right now, we've got our flagship apl application and it's being continuously deployed to production every time someone merges code to master. Um, and we'll be looking to move our, some of our other applications over in time, when they're ready. We've got the same rigor as we always had about what's ready to deploy and what's not. If it's red, it still doesn't go out. Uh, we've got the, so all that same reassurance that what we're deploying is the right thing and is doing the thing right, but we've got fewer delays. And to the, so much so, in fact, that we've, uh, we reckon we've added about one day of... Um, of developer capacity per day to our team. So that's, that's like hiring a whole person just to click buttons for you. Um, we replaced them with a small shell script. So we've got, um, yeah, that's, that's the equivalent of a junior salary, right? Yay. And people like us, at least for now, right? We're popular. Our, our latest NPS survey, that net promoter score, that's still in progress. We peaked at the results and they're encouraging. Um, so we're pretty happy with that. Um, so what did the team think of it, right? We had our retro yesterday. Um, this is hot off the press. The good stuff, so we found the right tool for the job and we, um, we felt really good about contributing a couple of things back to the open source community. Um, and those were, those are really, those are great things, right? Um, on the other side of it, we found that, you know, there were some issues. We did spend a lot of time working on BuildKite when we didn't need to. Um, our exact requirements weren't clear from the start. So we, um, yeah, we spent a lot of time discovering those things, um, rethinking and rethinking and rethinking because it hadn't been, we hadn't laid that stuff down by thinking about it at the start. And frankly, we should have found the right tool sooner and we should have done better by our clients, our engineers, by telling them what we were planning, um, what we were intending and how it would, how it would change their lives. But uh, for better or for worse, they deserve to know. So. Biggest lessons we took away, right? The first one, I haven't mentioned so far except in passing, but to understand the process you're automating is a huge advantage. Um, that that battle-tested, production-hardened, or the other way around, um, deployment process gave us a really fantastic starting point um, because we knew if we take a passing build and we run these commands, then the code will be in production. And that's a real load off our minds. It takes away a lot of that um, duty of, well, not the duty, but it takes away the difficulty of discovery that a lot of teams face when they've been deploying manually for years. Um, we had a huge advantage there. So the more that you can do to understand that process, the better off you'll be. The second one we learned by not doing it, and that was to learn from those who've gone before. So, um, if you're interested in continuous deployment, come talk to me. I'll, uh, I'll edify you. No, wait, yes, that's the right word. Um, so 
yeah, go read, go research, go find the tools. There probably is one for what you want to do. There's, there's plenty out there to learn, and that's, um, and that's part of your, your kind of duty of discovery almost, going into a project like this. Um, the third and final one was that you need to articulate the impact of what you're doing to those who are going to feel it. Right? In our case, that was our engineers. And we noticed a lot of confusion, and that was our fault. Right? So we could have done a lot more to tell them what we intended to do, tell them what it was going to do for them, and tell them how it would change the way that they worked. And that, I think, is uh, all I've got for you. So. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, what about, uh, how do you ensure you got quality for going in? So, okay. Yeah. Um, so how do we how do we ensure that we've got quality code uh, going into a process like this so that we can be sure that what we're deploying is is good code? Um, look, that's obviously going to vary a lot from team to team. Uh, the way we do it, we have a um, we have a continuous inter integration build that we really trust and that we've worked really hard to build up trust in. Um, and that's composed mostly of um, aspect tests, so automated tests, um, a moderately large suite of um, cucumber tests, so um, simulating user behavior in a browser um, with, with Selenium, I think. Um, and then we put the duty on engineers to both maintain that suite of tests and to uh, monitor and check the results of their work once it's gone out. So our engineers have the power to deploy code at any time. They also have the duty, the responsibility, to make sure that it's the right thing, that they've done all they can to make sure it's the right thing. And if it turns out not to be the right thing, to fix it right away. So that, that guy who hits the deploy button at 4.59 p.m. and then work, walks out the door, he might not be too popular the next morning. Um, so there's no surefire way to, uh, or there's no silver bullet to ensure quality of code, um, but a few thousand tests will, will help a lot. Up the back. Um, access to production. All of our engineers have access to production. Uh, we, uh, at the moment, engineers, I think, is uh, somewhere around the 30 mark, um, possibly a bit more, maybe 40. Any others? Oh, right here. Hi. Yeah. Um, first, um, what are you happy for without the continuous um, delivery? It was great. It was awesome. So, so to make it even better, that was good. <laughs> and the, the other thing is that, so I have questions regarding, um, so have you had problems in production that makes you roll back the chains at some point? Absolutely, we had um, one today. <laughs> so how do you manage that? Uh, so, so yeah, uh, so our deploy command is a, is a single terminal command. Um, that's, we've just moved into our continuous deployment tool. Um, sorry, the question was how, if we do need to roll back a change, um, how do we make that happen? So the, we've got that single command to deploy. Um, we've also got a single command to roll back. So that if something does go bad, we, um, we have the capacity to roll back a deployment very quickly. Um, also because of the, um, because of the speed with which we can get changes out the door now, if you do need to revert a commit instead of uh, rolling back a deployment and saying to the servers, use that other version of the code that I just switched away from. Um, if I need to revert a commit, make a new version and deploy that, that's also a, um, a reasonable way to go ahead. Uh, do you have another question? Yes. Uh, so, so what happened if the build in master fails? 
So all of you are, are stopped until this gets fixed, or how do you manage that thing? Yeah, that's right. So if a if a build on the master branch fails, um, that's a really bad thing because it holds everybody up. As long as master's red under this system, if master's failing, nothing goes out. So it's really important for um, for our engineers to be sure that um, the build on their branch is green, um, to be sure that it's going to merge well, and um, that they get notified if the um, if the outcome of their build is a failure, so that they can fix it as quickly as possible. Uh, and that's without without that green master, nothing else goes ahead, and that's. At, um, at first blush seems a little bit um, worrying. It's going to hold up a lot of changes if it's left unattended. On the other hand, for me, it's very reassuring because it means that only the stuff that is right goes out. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. So, so no, manual, no manual testing stage in the whole process, right? Um, any manual testing that we'll do, we'll do on um, a branch. So if I have a branch that I think is ready for deployment, we have some testing environments where I can deploy that branch on, um, on an ad hoc basis. Um, so I'll claim that environment in much the same way that I used to claim uh, the production environment. I'll claim a staging environment, deploy my code there, doing it, do any manual testing that I want to do. And once I'm happy with that, that's when I line up to merge into, or that's when I merge into uh, master. So what were our first? What were our gains in this process? The biggest one, honestly, has been that um, that net promoter score, because that is a um, that comes from a combination of saving people time, that productivity gain that I mentioned earlier. Um, we try our developers' patience a lot less with, uh, with a new process and a friendly way to, um, through, the, through the Samson UI that I haven't even shown you. Wow, go check that one out, it's good stuff. Um, but it'll, um, one of its features is to keep track of what was deployed and when. So that's, um, that gives us uh, a much easier time when we're debugging issues in production. But that, that biggest gain definitely um, a combination of productivity and the um, at the net promoter score, and the other one was sorry. Would you remind me? Uh, what next? So, what's what's the next iteration sort of look like? Um, in many ways, it's it's too soon to tell. We uh, we hit the button on this a week ago, but um, probably uh, my guess would be if I had a crystal ball, I'd say doing the same thing, but with some of our other projects. Um, so right now we've got our flagship web application that's being continuously deployed, and that's fantastic. We've got a number of other sort of ancillary and um, and sort of helper services that could really benefit from the same treatment. Hello. So we have uh, we do use uh, a form of blue green deployment, uh, very like Capistrano. Uh, at the moment, we've got, um, I think, on the order of 30 or 40 nodes that we deploy production code to uh, in our production environment. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm working from memory here. So that's, yeah, composed. Oh, no, gosh, sorry, you're testing my memory too far there. So, um, yeah, so we'll. We have fixed, or more or less fixed infrastructure based in AWS. Yep. At the moment, we'll um, uh, so a deployment will typically copy the code up to those servers, and then um, change a symlink to to change the version of the code being um, being run. Hello okay, again. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in some cases, it doesn't make sense to uh, deploy only one feature. So from the from the product point of view, is Sometimes it makes sense to deploy a bunch of features, right? So many developers were working on them. They have different branches, but it doesn't make sense to deploy only one of them. If from again from the product point of view, I would like to deploy the whole thing. Okay. How do you manage that situation? 
Sure. So there are probably a couple of ways to manage that scenario where you've got a lot of features where you want to go live all at once. Um, and I would, I would suggest that very few of them involve deploying the code for all of the features at one time. Um, so, but if you, if you did that, you might combine all your feature branches into one mega branch that you then merge and deploy if you had no other options. Um, another method might be to use something like feature toggles in your code to switch some features on and off so that if you deploy um, a, the code for a feature, it doesn't have to be exposed to users immediately and you can, um, you can choose uh, in a much more flexible way by, say, flipping a switch in the database or in your configuration when that, um, when that feature gets exposed to users. And in that way, you can start shipping a very, very small changes um, and build them up gradually over time. Um, and, with, and when you're ready to show all of it to everyone, then you can start hitting those feature toggles to, um, to turn them on. Right. <laughs> you folks ask some good questions. Are there any more? Hi, out the back. Sorry, would you mind speaking up or coming a bit closer? Yes? Um, so, oh, sorry, pardon that. Would you repeat that last part? Okay, so that feed loop, feedback loop is very much engineer driven. Um, so we use a couple of tools. One is uh, New Relic for performance monitoring, which a lot of us are probably or maybe familiar with. Uh, and that's one that uh, sort of monitors stuff like um, the speed of each web request to make sure, so we can use that to make sure that we're not hitting performance too hard when we deploy a new feature. Um, the other one we use for, uh, sorry, <laughs> the one we use for uh, error messages uh, and error monitoring is called Rollbar. And uh, it's a very handy one. It also has, both of those have the capacity to uh, notify us on chat if anything um, goes seriously wrong. So say we get, um, you know, the, I think it's the 10th, 100th, 1,000th of a occurrence of a new error, or we get a very high number of errors in a short space of time, um, we'll, get that, we'll get that chat notification to hey, say, hey, something's up. Um, otherwise, for less serious things, it's re really very much driven by the engineer. Um, so getting, getting that notification to say, hey, your code's out, and uh, they proactively go and check the, um, check the monitoring, check for errors, check um, the other one, sorry, track.js for, um, for front-end errors. Um, but uh, at the moment, a lot of this still is very much the responsibility of the engineer to, um, to handle. Any other questions? Hello again. What kind of applications do you, uh, you do billing applications? Do you do um, so Red, the Redbubble website is uh, it's a marketplace for uh, independent artists and printers. So um, uh, printers of... Pardon me. Where's very much like this fine specimen, um, and and for the people who buy them, right? So um, what we do is first of all um, allow independent artists to upload their work um, and format it in a way that's suitable for printing, like um, on this on this kind of thing, and uh, then we. Or, uh, I should know this, Pat. Um, <laughs> no, we uh, put them up for sale in our in our uh, in our web front end in our sorry shop front. That's the one. And um, once an order's been made, we uh, we handle billing on behalf of the artist, and we um, organise the the sending of that order through to one of our fulfillers who will print the print the artwork. On something like a T-shirt or a sticker, or I think um, we've got some cushion covers, phone cases, all that kind of thing. So that's that's kind of what Redbubble is about in a nutshell. 
Is that everyone? Lovely. Thank you very much for having me.